This is The Coach, an AK experience with me, Anthony K, and Coach Hugh Jackson. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Welcome, everybody, to The Coach and AK experience. I'm Anthony K, here as always with the coach, Hugh Jackson. Coach, how you doing tonight? Doing great. How you doing? I'm doing good, but we're going to start off because I need some advice. Okay. Because I'm this close. I'm this close. I'm starting to do my research. I'm reading up on cryptocurrency. I know you're in with Voyager. So <laughs> I'm just going to kick the show right off with, I, I want to make sure just before I dive in, I'm dipping my toe in. Um, to get a little bit more advice from you before I take the plunge. Anthony, get in and get in while you can. Uh, the Voyager app is sensational. Um, I think it's the best app out there to trade because they don't charge you a commission. And the thing that I'm, I'm in love with the app is um, when you think of Voyager, the USDC, which is like having a bank account and it pays eight and a half percent. And no, is it eight and a half percent if it would be uh, at the bank? No, but I think it's an equivalent of four percent, which is much more than you could ever get at the bank. Uh, I think they've done a great job of structuring a, a, a system that is, I'm not, I, I shouldn't say, you know, undercutting the banks, but, but doing a better job than what the banks are doing. All of their assets, um, there's 50 different crypto assets on the on the um, app there's several that pay interest if you hold a certain amount in the account um, so you can't get any better and i'm not ashamed to say this i got in this about seven months ago six months ago to be very honest uh, i put in about uh and i've, I've diversified obviously vgx is my biggest uh, Bitcoin is my second biggest and Bitcoin is the ultimate coin of cryptocurrency. Uh, and then I have uh, USDC, Ethereum, and I plan a couple others. And I'm being very honest, I, I have over from $4 million. And yeah. So, because that's what I was going to ask you, because obviously I think we've all seen the news, you know, from, from Bitcoin and Tesla right? When mm -hmm. Tesla brought a ton of Bitcoin, I believe it was at 50,000 50, a you. share. I'm joking. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I we believe you. <laughs> um, but no, but for the most, for most people, we know Bitcoin. We don't actually mm -hmm. know that there's, like you said, with on the Voyager app, there's 50 other uh, mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. So there are ones that for, you know, the regular people, we can, we can dive into. So we're not going to have to pay 50 grand a share. Is, is, I guess, right. And you don't pay 50 grand a share for Bitcoin. You might just buy a piece. Okay. And the thing that I love about this particular app is once you're in and you uh, paid $100, and let's say you go bring your wife in, you get $25 for bringing her in of Bitcoin. It goes automatically into the account. So oh, okay. that's another way for you to fund your Bitcoin account. You know, it's really amazing uh, what they're doing in the space. Uh, but yeah, you don't have to go pay 50 grand. I mean, you might just get a piece. And over time, I, I don't have the equivalent of a whole Bitcoin right now. But when right. I got in, I got in when it was at $10,000. Right. You know, and now it's been raised to it's not a bad, not bad in seven months. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing. So, yeah, it just, so for the, so for those, so for those kind of, people just jumping in and, and, and getting in now, it's you're taking little bits and pieces. You don't have to be too risky because you had mentioned uh, before that there are some that have kind of a stable growth plan because that's the, 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 the fear is the volatility right. of it. So Absolutely. there are, and they let you know on the app, hey, these are the ones that are high no. risk, high reward. No, you no, got to look that up. Okay, You have to look that up. You have to educate yourself. I can tell everybody that USDC is the most stable coin that's on there because it's one to one. Right. It's uh, FDA assured, you know, so it's no different than having a, a, a savings account. Um, everything else on there is going to be volatile, and and people have to understand. There's days where you make two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. There's days you lose four hundred thousand yeah. dollars. You know? but you trust that the process and what it is is going to keep going. I believe that. Um, the Voyager coin is going to go to $10 here in April. 
And if it does, boy, that's amazing. You know, I mean, if it's pushing at four, four cents now, I can only imagine where it's going to be down the road, you know? So I get very excited about getting in when I got in. And I would say to anybody now is, is still a good time to get in because I really believe that the coin is going to grow. Um, but it's been phenomenal. I mean, you're talking about uh, wealth legacy changing, and that's what this is. I think back a couple of years ago, uh, my wife and I have a friend, this couple, and, and this was, I want to say maybe three, maybe even four years ago, that they said, oh, you know, we're going to start, you know, putting a little money into this cryptocurrency thing because, hey, it's new and we want to see what happens with it. Yeah, they're very happy right now. And I wish I would have, I wish I would have listened. <laughs> but it's still, it's still not too late, right? How many times, no, but how many times have that happened that, you know, some people bring us something and we really don't understand it. So we kind of back off and we don't really bet it out because it's different. It's different than what we used to. We used to paper money. For me to be walking around with that kind of feeling on my phone, it is different. But at the same time, that's where the world's going. It's like, who moved my cheese? You know, everything is starting to go to a digital uh, uh, situation, a digital process. And pretty soon, I think money is going to be obsolete. I, I always tell, when we have these conversations with people, I always tell them this story because, one, I believe it to be true because it was one of my marketing professors. And he told me the story about his dad. He said his dad had this opportunity. Um, I believe it would have been in the 50s. And correct me if I'm wrong to whoever knows what year, but uh, $10,000 to get a very nice chunk of uh, percentage of ownership in this company. And he said, no, I think that's crazy. No one's ever going to eat fried burgers. That was McDonald's. <laughs> and he looks back and goes, and my dad kicks himself in his pants every day because it wasn't, you know, who, who would eat a fried burger? Yeah. Absolutely. All of us, <laughs> apparently like, everybody. You know, yeah. <laughs> your dad had one now too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's that, so don't be, don't be too afraid to jump in sometimes yeah. just because it's different. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And so we can get the Voyager app. Um, yeah. You can get the, well, you can download the Voyager app. Um, you can go to Voyager.com, download it. Um, if people are interested in uh, my promo code is coach. Uh, obviously some people who are, on the site, if they're sending it to their friends, they need to send, you can send from the app, uh, it, you know, another link that would take you directly into it so that you can get signed up. Um, it's very simple. It's putting $100 into any account and now it's open and now you're trading and you do, do it as you see fit. That's the thing I love about it because honestly, Anthony, there's so many other scams out there. There's so many people that would DM you and say, boy, we can make you this amount of money and this amount of time through cryptocurrency and they, they're all scam artists, you know, this thing, you're doing it yourself. And even if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to figure it out because obviously nobody's in this to lose money. You know, we're in it to make money. So and, well, it was one of the reasons why I said I wanted to, you know, I knew it was important to talk to you about it this week because just this week I've gotten someone on my IG account sliding into my DM saying, Hey, I can, I guarantee you I can get you this much return. And I went, yeah. Mm -hmm. No. you know let me talk to coach see if i can get in on this voyager app thing before it's before it's too late yeah uh, no. and anthony i would say that to anybody if people are sliding into your dm saying what they can do they can't do it they just all talk you know it's really a scam they want to take your money um, and they'll tell you to go buy bitcoin and watch what happens and they'll disappear so I know the scam game and, and you don't want to do it. That's why I think these apps, this Coinbase, um, Binance are really good because they give people who really are interested in finding out about what the cryptocurrency world is, the best opportunity to find out. But I don't think there's anything in the space like the Voyager app. I think what they're doing is going to change the game. Okay. So we're going to go download the Voyager app, promo code COACH. Okay, I'm going to dip my toe in, Coach. But I'm coming Let's after. Go. I'm gonna come after you if it doesn't work. You, you, I, you, if it doesn't work, I give you your money back. How about that? <laughs> I I got this on tape now. All right. Yeah, All right. yeah you do. Hey, but I'm a man of words. I I, I I appreciate. It. I feel much more comfortable now. Okay, we're gonna do that. Um. So from finance, I want to talk. I want to jump into football because that's obviously important. Okay. We spend a lot of time talking about the offensive side of the ball for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. It's exciting. You're the master of it. 
But there was a defensive player um, that asked to be released this week and got, or last week, got his release, J.J. Watt. And two things came out of that whole situation. The first one is uh, the obvious one. Hey, where is he going to go play? Because, right. uh, uh, you know, obviously he's still, I don't think he has 16 games in him per season, but I think he could give you eight or 10 really good games. And, mm-hmm. and he could be a difference changer to, to a defensive team that's kind of missing that one piece. We're going to talk about where he might land. The second piece, though, was how dysfunctional is the kind of inner workings of the Texans that now he's come out and said, hey, I want out of the, you know, that that's his only team. That's the only thing he knows. And he wanted out. And I guess part B to that is, and maybe it's because of his age, but why was it so easy for him to say, hey, I don't want to be here anymore. And they gave him a release. Now I get it. It's a different animal when you're dealing with a franchise quarterback, but they're giving the, hey, Deshaun Watson is our quarterback. He's not going anywhere answer versus, hey, we're going to try and make him happy and you know get him somewhere where he wants to go. So I don't know which one of those you want to start with. I'll, I'll let you pick, but I do want to touch on all of them. Okay. You know, Anthony, um, obviously, J.J. Watt's a tremendous competitor, a tremendous football player. I think there's a lot of teams that would be happy to have him, you know, whether it's the eight to ten games that he gives them everything he has. He's a veteran player. There's some skins on the wall. He's a pro. Um, he's the ultimate teammate. Uh, he's going to come into the locker room, and he's going to bring a real – presence which increases the value of your football team so I I think he still has it I'm shocked that Houston let him go especially in the situation they're in uh, the way it looks within the organization and so when I saw that they let him go the first thing came to my mind is okay well here comes not so much the rebuild but the reboot you know and I would think now I would hope they're saying we need to do the right thing by Deshaun Watson. Here's a guy that doesn't want to be here. We got a chance to get maybe a King's ransom for him. Um, We get to start this thing over. We just let one of the premier uh, cornerstone players of the organization go, which was I'm sure hard to do. Um, And who was also kind of tied to Deshaun. And now we got a chance to have a, another player in our locker room who may, doesn't want to be here. I mean, he said it, he's made it very clear. Um, so I would think you now as an organization, you pivot and you say, we're going to do the right thing by the player, right thing by the players moving him and the right thing for the organization is to get as much as we can. for him. So I think that's where this thing should really start to trend. Will it? I don't know. Um, because they made a decision to hire a staff that was going to hopefully help him stay there you know that's why i don't think you make those kind of decisions and not to get off subject but you look at what's happening in philadelphia you know here goes carson wentz but i think they hired the coach from indy because he kind of knew who carson wentz is and carson wentz don't want to be there so now you got to be looking and saying i'm getting a double whammy here you know what am i going to get for this so you got to figure those things out way ahead before you make these decisions but at the same time sometimes you never know how they're going to play out Yeah, it was, it was interesting because you would have, you know, and maybe they did make a few calls, but you would think a team like Houston that probably needs some draft picks, they probably want to get as many as they can. They're clearly, you know, going to have to rebuild. Mm -hmm. Someone will give you a, you know, now it's not gonna be maybe a first, but you're going to, you could get a a pick or two out of seven later round picks, right. For JJ Watt, you know, he, he can pick, Hey, this is the team I want to go to and get a bit. So I was, I was surprised that they just released them that quickly. And, and now, obviously, everyone's waiting for the, shoe to, the, the other shoe to drop, which is obviously going to be Deshaun. I think we both agree he's, he's not staying. I, I, think, I think unless something, you know, the miracle happens down there in Houston, I think he's, it's in his mind now to leave. And so he's leaving. Um, and now it's just going to be who, where they can get the best deal. Do you think, because those guys seem tight. And I don't know, I'm not in the locker room. I don't know. But J.J. Watt and, and Deshaun seem tight. Do you think he's waiting to see where Deshaun gets traded and then signs there? Like, are they, could it, could they be that tight or, Hey, J, it's time for JJ to take care of JJ. I, I wouldn't be surprised, but I do think it's time for JJ to take care of JJ. But you just said something that I think we all need to really focus on. You said that they released him, and you were kind of surprised. 
they gave him his unconditional release to allow him to go shop himself at any football team. That's true respect. Regardless of what I think or you think that they should have did, being in the situation they're in, they looked at the player. They said, you've given us unbelievable service. We need to do the right thing by you. And they allowed him to go. Why then would you not do the right thing with Deshaun Watson, who's given you everything he has? And I understand quarterbacks are hard to find. They're hard to evaluate and make sure you have the right one. And they have a really good one. But at the same time, if it doesn't work and if it doesn't fit, then it just doesn't fit. And if a guy's going to be not on board, you can't have your quarterback not be on board. If that's the case, that body language, uh, those particular feelings are going to show. And so if you're starting over with a new staff, you kind of, you kind of hamper these guys. You kind of put them in a situation where they don't get to be the best version of themselves because they're trying to coach a guy and fit a system to somebody who doesn't want to be there. And we all know he doesn't want to be there. Yeah. I think they definitely need to look. I think I get the not releasing him. Because if they release him straight flat out, they'll get murdered, right? They, there's too many drafts, mm-hmm. picks, players that they can get from. Yeah. So I get it, but but do it, right? Like make make the yes. trade. Don't don't try to yeah. hold on to him. I'm I'm with you. So it, it actually reminded me of something else. So Draymond Green um, came out yesterday and kind of made a big deal about. Uh, I think he was talking about Andre Drummond, how they kind of had him sit in uh, street clothes, and they've said, hey, he's basically going to get traded. I personally think he's gonna, he, they're going to buy him out. Um, I don't know that everyone knows he's gone. So I think in the NBA, it's a little different. I don't think anyone's going <laughs> to give up too much for, for Andre Drummond. But that being said, he brought up an interesting point about why can teams, you know, sit players and, and, you know, put them in street clothes and tell them, Hey, we're, we're working on a trade for you. You just sit there, stay healthy, stay, you know, wait for us. But when a player comes out and says, Hey, this isn't the right situation for me. I want to leave. They're kind of vilified. Now I get, I hate to say I get the double standard, but I get it. It's the employer versus the employee and they have some, you know, can do things a little bit differently. But then I thought of a bigger picture and I thought, yeah, well, you know what? If I'm a team saying I want to trade this person and I'm a player and I say I want to be traded, well, you know, regardless of who has more power in in that situation, they still should be thought of the same. But you don't think the organization's bad for wanting to trade a player, then you shouldn't think the player is bad for wanting to get into a different situation. And, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you here because it brought up a different conversation as I had this today with a lot of people. And it was coaches can leave teams, right? And, and pick where they go, um, even if they're in a contract. And then it brought up a whole nother conversation, which I know you know a lot about, which is the NCAA. Well, mm-hmm. if a player wants to transfer schools, oh, he's got a red shirt, he's got to do this, he's got to do that. But a coach in a contract can step down and then go coach somewhere else. The, the, the gap between, you know, and coaches, you know, I, to a certain extent, I get the ownership of the team is saying one thing versus a player, but players and coaches are both employees of the team. Why is there such a disparity between coaches and players? You know, it's really interesting. Um, the fact that Draymond Green could voice his opinion tells you a lot about the NBA. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, He's not going to uh, lose his value because of what he said. And he felt very comfortable in that setting, talking about something between players and ownership. And he basically demanded that they should have the same respect that the owners have when they want to get rid of a player. You know, that, you know, again, as you, you really alluded to, that within itself to me is huge. That is not the way in the National Football League. And I think you know that. Agreed, agreed. Uh, every league kind of has its own process that they kind of run through. I think what Draymond Green said is true. I think, I think it should go both ways, you know, because if it doesn't, it's not fair. But at the same time, people are going to say, ownership is going to say, we pay you. So we're paying for a service. If we decide we want to set that service down uh, until we find a suitable a trade partner, and we don't want to take the risk of you getting hurt, and that's what we do. Please know that those are the same things that happen in the National Football League. They just don't announce it. Right. We'll sit a player, a player is supposed to be in the game, they'll take him out knowing that 
let's say we're right up into the last cut, you know, and so they know they have a trade going. That player probably won't play in the game at all. You know, he might get a couple of snaps just to keep him um, in, involved in the game, but knowing he's, they're going to move him. So this process happens. You just never get a player that can talk about it out front in the National Football League like they do in the NBA. Yeah, I think we do. We definitely applaud the NBA for that 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 ability. Now, also, I would say there's I feel like and I, I don't know the, the statistics on this, but I feel like there are more in season trades, I think, in the NBA than the NFL which mm-hmm. probably goes plays into it a little bit as well. But yeah, no, to your point, um, I wish the NFL players, you know, would speak out a little bit more and maybe, you know, yeah. to your point, they, they just feel they can, I guess with the non-guaranteed contracts makes it a little bit harder. That's the biggest thing. And that's the thing I think they're going to start really shooting for is the guaranteed money. Yeah. You know, that's the one thing that players truly love paragraph five money. They don't care, but what's my guaranteed signing bonus what am i going to get that i can put in the bank right now and i think when you don't have that kind of leverage like the nba does like baseball does i think you get afraid because then they can move you out you know without having to pay you a certain amount of your contract so that becomes an issue for nfl players yeah i've seen um you know we've talked as we've started to talk about contracts and that where a few years back, you're seeing bigger and bigger guarantees because obviously players are pushing for it. I think Kirk Cousins, I think, had a fully guaranteed uh, mm-hmm. on his contract. And and it makes sense as a player because I saw somewhere, you know, oh, this guy just signed for $200 million. Yeah, but they could cut him after a year and he's, he's not getting anywhere near that. That's the thing that people, I don't think, um, really understand the contract. Okay, so as I just mentioned the term paragraph five, the only money that players are really guaranteed is the guaranteed money. The paragraph five is earned over the course of the season. And for instance, I laugh when people say a guy is getting $200 million. Okay. And he has a six year deal. People don't understand that that $200 million is split up over that six year deal. And he may get 40 million of it and not get the other 160, you know? Exactly. And people don't understand that. And if the guy takes the money up front in a signing bonus, then on the back end of it, all that money is recalculated from a signing bonus and your paragraph five, because some of it has to go in paragraph five. It can't all be signing bonus. So uh, that's the way the cap works. And so I think people have to understand that and people don't. So when you hear these astronomical contracts, it does not mean that they're getting that money. It is just kind of spread out over the years. What you look for is the guaranteed money. Right. And then you have, you know, you can really have a conversation and see if a guy really has a chance to uh, make it. Yeah. Well, and then other, you know, people say, well, he still got 40 million. They're like, yeah, it, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'll take it. But at the same time, you signed a $200 million contract. So to get 40 million of that, yeah. you know, I, I say this, you know, I don't know if you know this in, in Canada, when you win the lottery, that money is yours. No mm-hmm. tax. It's yours. I did not know that. And so when people say, Oh, look at this Powerball, it's a hundred million dollars. I always laugh because I go, yeah, but they have to 50% to tax. So they get 50 million. And then if they want it in a lump sum, they cut it in half. So it's 25 million. And everyone mm-hmm. laughs at me and goes still 25 million. I said, yeah, but you want 100 or you signed for 100, but you only got 25 of it. It's it's not the same. No, it's um, not. So, yeah, so that's, I'm glad we brought that up because, um, uh, you know, that's that's part of it, I think, is that guaranteed money, which I think keeps a lot of NFL players from kind of really speaking their voices. So it, it's happening more, uh, yes. but I still think there's there's a way to, ways to go. Absolutely. And so we're speaking about people who speak their mind. So another thing came out today, basketball slash football related, LeBron James as a, would he have been a Pro Bowl tight end? And, and I laughed at first and I thought, well, he flops a little bit more for, than my, for my liking as he just got, you know, warned about flopping on the basketball court, but now he's on the Lakers. So we, we hope him all the best and we hope AD gets healthy and we get another yeah. ring. As, I don't know if you saw, I finally got my Laker oh, championship ball up yes, there. Um, yes. And so I hope everything goes well for him. 
but it, it brought up an interesting conversation. What do you think? You've seen, like I, I've said, he's he's big enough. He's he's strong enough. He's fast enough. Uh, he's got good hands. Do you think he could have made it in the NFL? Yes. LeBron James could have done anything he wanted to do. And uh, I think he would have had the right temperament had he played football. I mean, um, he was, uh, when you saw him in high school playing, he was a tremendous player. Yeah. You know, good, good wide receiver. So I think he could have done it. Um, and did it at a high level. I really do. I just think some of these guys are really gifted and uh, they could play in any sport and have success. And I, would he have had the impact at the position that he has on the basketball court? I don't know that because I don't know his, his ability to catch in traffic and right. extend and all those things. But because of the man, the person and the way he works and the way he takes care of himself, you sure think he would have a pretty good chance to make it happen. Yeah, I just, I see his frame and I don't think, I know in high school it was wide receiver. I, he's got to be a tight end, right? Oh, yeah. if, if, right? He's got to be a tight end. And then I think, yeah, you know, not that I, I played tight end in high school too. I don't know that how much I impacted the game <laughs> though, right? So yeah. it's it's a little bit different. Um, he might've been the best tight end, but you know, the best tight end right now is what, Travis Kelsey? And oh, he yeah. impacts the game, but if you have to pick him or Mahomes, you're picking you Mahomes. Pick, oh, yeah. Picking Mahomes. We know who the what the premier position is in the yeah. national football, and it's quarterback. And it's tight end is not second. And so that's why what Travis Kelsey has done is tremendous. I mean, he has wide receiver numbers. Right. You know, but we're calling him the best. So I get it. Um, could LeBron James have been in that conversation? I probably doubt it, you know. Um, because football's a different game, you know, and, and and being as tall as he is, he would have taken a few more shots than normally other guys would have taken. So yeah. what was going to be his longevity? How would he really respond to the physicalness, as you mentioned early, uh, week in and week out? We all don't know those things. Yeah, there's very few athletes who, like, and that's why the, the question came up, I assume, but there's very few athletes who can play two professional sports at yeah. a very high elite level, right? We know yeah. Dion, yeah, Dion, yeah. Bo Jackson. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. a short, short list um, not- for for sure. But yeah, like I said, I think he's got the size and stuff. I just, I don't know, would he want to, right? And, and, and I think that's the difference too. In basketball, and you know this, one player can Ooh. impact a game, especially yeah. someone like him who's playing like a point guard forward position, can make such an impact where in football, there are some special people that can impact the game, but to a certain extent, but at, you know, at the best of times you're on the field half of the time, right? Cause you're, you're not playing, we're not playing offense and defense anymore. There, right. I don't, I, you know, very few players are playing uh, both ways. So, yeah. So I think, that, you know, and there's another, you know, 10 guys on the field with you. So, it is. you know, every quarter, I think there was uh, I hate to pick on my bears here, but there's a lot of talk this week about uh, Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Look like what Patrick Mahomes would have looked like if the Bears had drafted him. <laughs> I saw that with a picture of him in a uniform. <laughs> yeah, I loved him. I love seeing him in the uniform, mind you. But yeah, it was, yeah, if you don't have an offensive line, you don't have weapons. Yeah, I mean, no, nah, he had weapons in Kansas City. But, you know, if you're getting pressured and running for your life, you know, running, we talked about it last week, running over 400 yards oh, yeah. um, to try and get, you know, scrambling. It, it's, it doesn't matter where you're playing. It's going to be tough. Yep. It could be tough. So we talked about the NBA and how they're more kind of able to voice their opinions. And, and we're going to stick with the NBA a little bit because Mark Cuban did mm-hmm. something that, I don't know if I'm going to catch some flack for this, but I'm going to put it out there. I, I said it about a year ago, I think. Um, no, I said, you know when I said it? I said it when, I think it was the, with Drew Brees coming out initially when he had talked about, uh, they'd asked about Colin Kaepernick and taking a knee and then Drew Brees had said, you know, oh, we got to stand for the flag. And I immediately had this conversation with someone and Mark Cuban made a decision this week not to play the anthem before games. So I'll tell you, my thought was, I get it. There was some point in history where, you know, to support the troops, to support, you know, whatever was going on in the world, they started playing anthems before games. And I said, well, stop playing the anthem before the game. Because it's not an international competition, although we call it the World Series and, you know, you win an NBA championship. We're world champs. Well, there's only players in one country. You're not really world champs, but I get slack for that too. But how do you feel about the anthem? Like if it was 
removed before the game, just it kept for international competition and not for, you know, when you got LA versus Chicago, we're all, you know, American teams. Do we mm-hmm. need the anthem played? You know, Anthony, I, um, I know it's a tough one, but it is for me personally, I love the anthem before the game. Cause it's what I know. Right. It's what I grew up on. I hate to say it this way. Cause you know, I use this all the time It's normal to me. And so if it's not played, it would seem abnormal to me. What I took from Mark Cuban is he was trying to stand on the right side. He didn't feel like what we're saying, that it really had value. And so he says, we're not going to play. I thought I was really impressed that he was taking a stance. Regardless that the NBA came back and said, no, you're going to play the man. Yeah. And he came back and said he doesn't have a problem with it. Uh, But I I felt like things were slightly changing, that the views of people who are in these um, big positions, the owners or however you see it, they're starting to see and hear enough of what's going on. And they're starting to react, you know, that saying, wow, maybe, maybe I am off here. Um, and so I, I'm appreciative of that. I understand the league because there's pro, you know, obviously league has his own set of rules and, and, and bylaws that they have to go by. And so, um, you know, they slapped him on the wrist for it, but I commend him for, for having uh, some forethought and, and maybe not playing the anthem. Yeah, I know. We, well, when we talk about, you know, it's normal doesn't necessarily mean it's right. That's Absolutely. still in your line, but I just, you know, that's why I say I, I, I get it, right? I, I understand it and it's a good, you know, thing that we, to do, but do people, you know, when I look around now, granted, we haven't unfortunately been in an, in an arena for a while, but when I look around and see half of the people, you know, eating their hot dogs, drinking their beer, right? Like if everyone was standing and, and you know, treating the anthem for what it is, right? And paying honor to the country, I'm, I'm with you. But, you know, I'm seeing people, like I said, drinking their beer, having conversations, and they're standing. Some some of them are sitting. Okay, so why are we doing it? And, and yeah. if it's causing, you know, controversy and it's causing, you know, people button heads, it's just like, okay, then take it out. So, I don't know, maybe I'm oversimplifying. And I respect it. what you're saying, too. I get it. But, boy, I would be, um, I might be a little lost without the end. I mean, because that, that's been the process. You go to the yeah. locker room, come back out. You know, you flip the coin, here comes the anthem. You Sometimes you got some great entertainers. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you meet people, you see people that you probably wouldn't see if they didn't perform the national anthem. And honestly, there's times where I kind of tear up, you yeah, know. Okay. It, it means that much to me. Now, yeah. do I think the, some of the players get it? Heck no. They <laughs> see it just as, boy, this is what happened at our college. Right. It's the same thing in the National Football League. Here we go. So I understand and respect where you're coming from. Well, listen, you said some great entertainers sing it. We've had some people butcher it, too. <laughs> yes, we have. So you got to be careful who you pick. Uh, so we're going to flip back to basketball, uh, to football. And this one, I guess, I was, I was hoping to talk to you about it before, you know, right away. And what ended up happening was it happened and then they reversed the decision. So Urban Meyer, we talked about him getting hired down there and, and he hired uh, Chris Doyle Mm -hmm. um, who had, you know, when I heard some of the things that his, that he had, I guess, technically been accused of. So we don't want to put it on him there. You know, all the players that came out and spoke out against him and, and that he, he didn't get fired from his job after all that. He got a buyout. And I think it was pretty healthy too. And in today's climate, to for Urban Meyer to just then hire, because I believe it was it was recent, it was June, I think that he was uh, maybe, yeah, I think June that he had, uh, I guess, resigned or parted ways. Um, to, in, this, in today's climate, to make that hire, is that just arrogance? Is that, you know, just helping out uh, someone I'm close to? Is that hiring someone I know just for the sake of hiring someone I know? Like, what goes into that decision? Now, he since, I guess, has resigned uh, because of all the backlash, but what goes into making that? Like, are you not thinking that there's going to be backlash? People are just going to let it slide? 
Um, privilege. I can kind of do what I want, get away what I want. And this time he got slapped, you know? And so I think it's gonna teach Urban Meyer a lesson. You know, he came out and said, he's known this guy for 20 years. He, they never worked together. So I don't know how he could say he knew him. I just know that the head coaches have every resource to find out any information they want about anybody. And so this was known. Right. And to me, this was a flat, I do what I want. You know, you don't tell me what to do. And they did it. And then when they realized how bad it was, they said, wow. And we can say the guy resigned all we want. They told this guy, they, he got to get out of there. Right. Because that will tar- tear down your locker room. I guarantee you that Urban's going to have to address this with his locker room um, and with the organization because mm-hmm. it it was so out there what this guy's character had been. Uh, and like you said, right, wrong, or indifference, that's what's out there. You know, you, you deal with it. And so you made a decision to bring someone into the organization that had a black eye. I mean, a real black eye. And you put it on, I know him, I vetted this out. I feel good about this. And then the media jumped on it. And then others jumped on it and you go, oh, I'm gonna have some trouble here. You gotta go, yeah. <laughs> I gotta stay faith here. And then they come back and say, they didn't do a good enough job. They didn't think it through. They didn't go the extra mile. Are you kidding me? Yeah, you did. You knew exactly what you were doing. Let's just be honest here. You did, and you thought it was going to be okay because of your status, and and it's not. Listen, I'm all for second chances, right? A hundred percent. And you know, if you go through a process of, hey, this is what I did, this is where I made my mistakes, this is what I've done to correct those actions and learn, educate, you know, etc. And t- some time has to pass. I would say, okay, right? Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll give you a pass. But this is fresh. There's right. no way that, you know, anyone can just, oh, I'm, I'm a different person now. It's just, it's impossible for me to, to believe that. And to your point, they had to go through some type of vetting process. Now, do some coaches, do some, you know, people slip through the cracks? Sure. But this mm-hmm. is something that you can eat. Like I could, you know, I knew nothing about Chris Doyle. I Googled his name and right. <laughs> there it all was. It didn't take much, right? I'm not an investigator, but it, if I can find it that quick anybody can find it. Yes. Um, So I just, yeah. So immediately I thought that's just Urban Meyer, you know, being, you know, I find that certain with certain success comes a certain arrogance of, Hey, I can, you know, here I am, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and that's what I thought it was. It's like, he obviously knows him, right. If he says he's known him for 20 years, he knows him and he knows what happened. He just didn't care. It's just like, Hey, that's my guy. I'm going to give him a job. And, And that's, and that's kind of the problem. And, and, We're going to talk a a little precursor to next week because I've got some info on some nepotism with hires. We're Mm. going to talk about that next week. So a lot of that, I know them, so I'm hiring them. We're going to talk about that. Um, But the Chris Doyle thing brought up another thing that we don't talk about. We rarely, I don't think we've ever talked entertainment. And this is more about the story than about the entertainment. I don't know if you watch The Bachelor. My my wife is an avid watcher, so I (laughs) have to hear about it. Um, and so Chris Harrison, who hosts The Bachelor, one of the contestants, I guess, on the show got into, I was gonna say a little bit, but a lot of came under fire because she went to a party back in 2018. That was this, uh, it was antebellum theme. It was at a plantation. I believe they, it, not that year in 2018, but previously they had dressed up in like Confederate garb. Mm -hmm. And so obviously when those photos came out, she got a lot of heat for it. She said she didn't know, she didn't understand that it was, you know, that it was racist. She didn't, she says, I didn't get it. Okay. Chris Harrison then comes out as the host of the show and, you know, tries to defend her a little bit in the sense that, hey, like, let's, let's find out the story first before we, you know, uh, we burn her at the stake. Let's find out. But he did some stuff that I think rubbed some people the wrong way. I don't think anyone was mad that he defended her right. when he started saying, well, are we looking at through the lens of 2021 or 2018? Right. And uh, yeah, I believe he used the term woke police about 20 times. Um, and where this is going with the question I want to ask you is what, how do we deal with 
you know, there's a, look, there's, there's racist people in this world. Mm -hmm. There's non-racist people in this world. Yes. And then there's, there is a big chunk of middle ground that maybe don't know that they're doing or saying something because it's normal and, and they don't know how do we react and how far back do we go into their history to say, hey, you know what, in 2018, 2015, and 2014, you did this and that's wrong. And do we kill them for it or do we give them an opportunity to say, hey, do you know why this was wrong? Let me teach you and Black History Month, so you know, a good, I think good segue into what we're gonna talk about next, but how do you go about that conversation to say, hey, this is wrong, this is why it was wrong and educate them and then they make their decision. Then they're going to go one way or the other. They're going to say, hey, no, I, I feel this way. I'm, and that's what I'm going to do. Or they go, you know what? Hey, I didn't know. And let me see what I can do to like educate more people. I think that's the key. I, so where I sit on that, I'm in that middle group. that Because I think there are more people that say things that they don't know what they're saying. They've heard it or they responded a certain way. And it... it comes off wrong and but they don't know I, I think those people you got to teach you know I think you have to give them an opportunity I don't think you bury them I think it's a real teaching moment the person that you know is racist you're not changing that right I don't care what you say it's just not no I, I, I think if it, someone no matter what you be, I've always said this no matter what you believe in belief is a very strong word Absolutely. And once you believe in something, it's in there. It's in there, right? It's but, in it, but if you have an idea, I, you know, I stole this from the movie Dogma. If you have an idea, right. ideas can change with information. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? But belief, uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm with you. If they believe that, they're done. Yeah. So, so that's why, that's where I sit on it. And I think um, it, it is the biggest moment and opportunity to get it right with someone. And especially if they have a feeling of, of wanting to know and wanting to understand where they could have been better at, you know, um, I think it's awesome. But I don't think enough of that happens. I think we really do crush people uh, and make it, uh, everything is black and white right now. I don't like to see any man lose his job or, you know, his finances over something that he just made a mistake in and didn't understand what he was saying. Um, but someone's going to judge that, as you right. know, day and age of social media, how fast things can get around. Once you get one sound bite, here comes the rest of them, and boy, you're in a sling because of it. I hate to say it, Coach, but it, you don't even need a sound bite. I, I, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week. How do you deal with people on social media? And and it was funny. It was it was right after that someone messaged me and you know said because I'm white, I'm racist. And I'm like, really, do you not listen to my show? Like if, like I'm trying to help here and we're having conversations. I, I, it's just odd, but, um, and it was just, and I said, because I'm white, I'm racist. And the answer was yes. Cause I even replied back. I said, really? Like just, just, yep, uh, that you are. And so I'm like, okay, so th there's, there's extreme on, on both sides, but that's mm -hmm. why I wanted to talk to you about it because, you know, I don't know how I feel I'm being honest, I don't know how I feel that someone would lose their job because, you know, they said something out of ignorance, right? If we, if everyone lost their job because they said something out of it, we might all be out of work, Absolutely. Uh, right? Like, it's just now, like I said, I think he, he may have defended it too much, but I, I, I want to talk more about her. You know, if she honestly didn't know, and had, I don't know how you don't know going to a plantation and have a Confederate, car, or I guess they had changed it. Sorry, I shouldn't put that out there. Um, they weren't doing that. It was just a, it was just the same type of party, but without the the dressing up. Um, but you know, I just I feel like are we too quick? Maybe that's the question. Are we too quick to condemn people and say you made a mistake? You know, you're you know this you know here that I don't even know what this means. The cancel culture. I'm old. I don't get it. Um, but it's hey, we're, are we too quick to just cut people off it, instead of saying hey, do you know you were wrong? And you'll know because if they don't want to listen you know they're too far on the other side. Right. But if they say, no, what did I do, right? And then they understand, should we, is it too early, right? Uh, to start saying, hey, let's let's look at educating and, and, and doing that piece before we just condemn people. 
Absolutely. I think everything should be a case by case basis. I think um, everybody's really quick now because of the heightened issues that have happened. And right. people think, man, I have to respond right away. You know, there's people who lose their jobs. There's people who lose their, lose everything uh, behind making a statement. I, I'm totally agree with what you're saying. Heat of the moment, not understanding. I mean, let's work together here. You know, and I think um, it's going to be, I truly believe that's the next phase that's coming. Um, but in order for that to happen, I think there's still got to be um, some real deep diving conversations, as we said before, because you got to know that the person isn't racist because you don't want to leave that seat there. It kills your whole organization, in my opinion. So, well, I, I know the people who are racist because after our first episode, the, the 150 people who like unfollowed me uh, and, and said, what do you do? What are you talking about? Those people I know. So, and good riddance and good riddance them. Let's be honest. They'll be um, back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Um, but that being said, so black history month, mm -hmm. I, I'm talking all about stuff. I'm torn in the middle here. So black history month. Yep. It's important. Should happen. But isn't black history, American history, and shouldn't it be taught all year round? Absolutely. I, I get, Anthony, I really get so concerned with all of these black terms, you know, um, I just do, we got black Friday, we have black this, we got black, I just, I agree. I think we really need to take this, these narratives out, you know, and, and it's really, like you said, it should be studied year round, everything about the color black, the color white, whatever it is, is special. Let's celebrate it. Let's talk about it all the time, not just one month. You know, I think you got to live it every day. I live in my skin every day. You know, I don't just live it in a month, you know, and, and there's no month that's more important to me than the next, you know, so let's, let's be honest here. And, and, you know, we bring out some information. We talk a little bit more about the history of, of blacks, you know, but outside of that, that's nothing else that we do, you know? So what are we really trying to accomplish here? Are we trying to celebrate the past so that we can understand what the future is? Or are we really trying to have people understand how they should, you know, trend forward in the future? I, sometimes I get stuck in those two lanes. I'm sure there's a bad joke. Uh, about the fact that, you, that Black History Month is the shortest, coldest month of the year. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that because I think it's important that... Um, <laughs> oh, boy. I think it's important that, you know, we talk about this all the time where when things escalate, we start to talk about them more. And then, you know, the news cycle runs and we stop talking about it. And I feel the same way. And I saw an interview with Morgan, Morgan Freeman, I think it was. So if it wasn't him, I apologize. But I think it was Morgan Freeman. And he was like, he goes, what? They asked him and he goes, no, I don't think there should be a Black History Month. And he said this, he said it should be taught every, all the time just because it's it, it's part of the culture. If you're talking America, you can't yeah. talk black and white, right? Black. It's It didn't happen at different times. It was all inter, inter you know, what like it or not, we're all kind of mingle, intermingled together. Yeah. We yeah. can't separate, We even, even through, you know, segregation, it was still a, a history that's together, if if that makes sense. Absolutely. Right? We, we tried to separate, you know, they tried to separate where we were and what we did and where we ate and all that. Still, there's still, it's still one history. Still together. Still and so, there. so that's part of me that says, hey, that's why it needs to be kind of ingrained in the whole year round. The other part is, and this is, and this is a bigger one because it's going to be hard, is whoever wins a war writes that history book. And so the, the history books aren't 100% accurate. No. How do you go back and reteach? You know, everyone thought it was a certain way, but it wasn't. It was, you know, there's some more truth. Because I tell you, the more that I read up, the more that I learn, the more that we talk, the more that I talk with others, the more that I'm like, wow, if even, you know, not all, look, there's people like we've agreed upon that can't be changed, but there's some that are on like on the fence. If they knew some of the things, some of the horror stories that not just blacks, 
Asians, uh, yeah. other people from other, like everywhere, but obviously it was yeah. worse, um, had to deal with, are still dealing with. I think that changes some minds and opens some doors to people going, I didn't know. And I think there's a lot of, I didn't know. I think a few episodes ago, we talked about people, you know, being in that bubble, you know, never leaving their town, never leaving their state or their city, whatever, and just not understanding, you know, what's going on outside of their world. And school's the one place where you can start early um, and have those, my six-year-old, um, and I got to remember how the, how, why she asked this, I don't know why she asked this question, but my wife called me into the room and she said, hey, your daughter wants to know what's the difference between, you know, why did someone refer to that person as black? What is the difference between a black man and a white man? And I looked at her and said, just the color of the skin, he's just a little darker than I am. And she said to me, you can't tell maybe with this lighting, but she goes, so are you black daddy? Because you're darker than I am. And I went, I'm not considered black in, out in the world, but no, but, and then I gave her a reference. I said, hey, you know, um, my, my friend, Josh, she goes, yeah, he's a lot darker than I am. She goes, yeah, are we any different? She says, no. I said, then there, there, you're, there's your answer. You've answered the question for yourself. Okay, daddy, great. And she went to sleep. And it was just like, it was, it seemed really easy for me to say it. Why isn't everyone, did, what's the difference? Nothing. It's the color, you know, you know, you're lighter than I am. I'm darker than you. Okay. Are you, and uh, me, you, you and I coach, are we different? Right. No, no, we're not. So interesting, Anthony, because what you just shared is what happens in many homes. Of, of course. Get asked and how we as parents deal with the question is what our world becomes right and what people don't understand um our kids are very um, thoughtful mindful when they're young to ask these kind of questions because they see something that or hear something that just doesn't add up and so i you know again commend you and i know you're that kind of man you walked her through it the best you could yeah, yeah. You, you never know as you know as a parent you never I, I said i hope i answered that well yeah. and i right. think it was i think it was because they had started talking about black history month at school yes and she, and she had asked why is there black history month right and and but think of the other side of that spectrum there's people that don't right walk their kids through it and so the biggest point i'm trying to make it starts in a home it's a learned behavior it's something that is taught you know and then and only then does all this entitlement fall into place. And I think that's where a lot of these things come from. And I, and I do believe that there's some minorities that do it the other way too. They go too far, you know? So I get it and understand it, but at the same time, um, educating, educating our youth, educating our kids, it's just so important to understand today's world because we're not gonna be here always. And we just wonder how are they gonna be able to navigate these things? Because will there be real change by time that we're not here? I don't know that. Sadly, I, I, I don't think there'll be enough. Um, yes. You know, I think we're, I hope, I don't even say I think, I hope we're headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, I think if, you know, if anything kind of came out of this week for me with you know, when she started asking questions was, you know, that's why I wanted to talk to you about it as well. Cause I'm, I, you know, I was hoping you'd be like, yeah, that's a good job. Uh, yeah. Make me feel a little bit better about the answer. Um, but you know, it, it goes to the, you know, I hate to say it, I'm against black history month. I want it to be, you know, all just history. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we should teach those things. And, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions. I think there's a lot of untruths, um, that are, that are in our textbooks. And, you know, I guess it's a good start uh, with one month, but, um, you know, I don't know how we make that change, but uh, hopefully we can we keep talking about it. And yeah, I think more people are now questioning why are we having Black History Month. And I hate to say it, but it's people like LeBron James who say, hey, look, I celebrate, you know, what that is every day. You know, I think more people that start to have those type of sound bites, it will start to change. And it will, not that they will ever give up what Black History Month is, but they can really focus on what the education could be for it. 
you know, because around the world, like you said, every classroom is trying to teach it. And if you're teaching one thing that's wrong out of a book, yep. then in my mind, everything's wrong, you know, and it just, you're really putting some bad information into the tank. So I, I totally understand where you're coming from there as well. Yeah. And look, it's not, you know, we focused on Black History Month, but it's Black history. It's Aboriginal. It's, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot uh, of, you know, bad information out there. So, uh, you know, I, it's funny, I heard a story and I had to look it up and, and cause I was like, this can't be true, but I, I'm, I don't know that we've ever talked about it. I'm my background. Like I was born in Canada, but my parents mm -hmm. were born in Greece and all my grandparents, like I'm hundred percent on both sides is Greek heritage. And and, you know, someone, had, the reason I looked it up is because someone accused my ancestors, like said, you should pay me Twitter. You got to love Twitter. You got to pay me because I'm black and you had slaves. And I went, but did I, let me look it up. And so I looked it up and I found this really cool thing. And I was like, no one ever, I'm 40 plus And I didn't know this until this year. So when the, when the first kind of Greeks migrated to the U S it was after, after slavery. So mm. I'm happy to say none of my ancestors had had slaves, uh, which I, I, I think that's a good thing. However, when they came to the South, they weren't allowed, the KKK actually came after them and said, you're not allowed, to, you know, we're not, white people aren't allowed to come to your restaurants because that's what they all did was they started restaurants. The only people that would come and eat at these couple of Greek restaurants in the South were Blacks. And they're like, oh, we don't care because we don't, we need to make a living. We don't care who comes and eats here. And the archdiocese of the Greek Orthodox Church marched with Martin Luther King. And there's this great photo of, and I don't know if you've ever seen a Greek Orthodox priest. They have these really high hats and really huge beards. Yeah. And he's walking side by side with Martin Luther King, right? And you're just like, wow. I'm like, that's, that's fantastic. Wouldn't have, I never would have known that. No one ever talks yeah. about that. Yeah. And it's just like, these are stories that need to be heard is that, look, it's not everybody there were like, there are, you know, just if people just learn and understand that we, the only way we succeed is if we succeed together, Together, I yes. think it changes enough minds. Look, there's still going to be the people on the other side, but I think mm -hmm. if you can, if you get the majority speaking out, cause I think that's the difference, right? Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. If the majority are speaking out for what's right, then right becomes normal. Absolutely. You just said it. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. And I think a lot of people are. I think people are trying to make what is right normal because what is normal is not right. So it's, it's, it's so obvious. I think you, you said it extremely well. Um, can we really create change? Yes, I believe we can. But it's an everyday occurrence. You got to work at it every single day. Somebody's got to carry that stick out in front of everybody uh, and not be afraid to, to because there's going to be people that challenge you. There's going to be people that don't understand. Yeah. That's okay. But you got to stand for the right things. And if you do, I truly believe we'll come out on the other side. But that's yet to, to really, you know, express itself. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it when it happens. That's for sure. Well, we'll keep working on it. And I'm going to leave you last question of the night. I'm sure, like I do, you watch a lot of football on Sundays. Mm -hmm. How was your first Sunday without football? It was, Although you probably still were doing something I was, related. But. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to be working with some athletes at the House of Athletes, so I can find times to always work with them, be around them. But you start flipping through the channels. And I used to be a college basketball fan. I'm not as much anymore. Um, there is a few college football games that are being played. I'm really excited about watching Deion Sanders team against Grambling. That's going to be coming up here in March. Um, but it was different. It felt like a real letdown. You know, it's like it's gone. You know, NFL football is gone. You know, so where's the next league? When is it going to start? You know, who's going to create something to all of a sudden we can keep this thing going? Because I really believe that a lot of things happen when sports are played. We watch basketball come back. We watch what it created. You know, it, all of a sudden the social injustice things kind of died down. And I thought they did a great job in the bubble, you know, of expressing what the issues were. 
Um, here then came football, you know, and how is this going to be played? Uh, they were going to have some names on the back of their helmets, but at the same time, we didn't even have conversations about what was going on as much, you know, baseball, same thing. You know, it just, I think we all feel good about where we are when there's sports being played. And that's got to tell us something. And I hope it tells the players something, take your platform and feel comfortable that you can have real conversations. Because the one thing the pandemic has taught us is we can be here on a Zoom and have as many really great conversations as we did if we were in a, in a boardroom together. And so it allows many more people to be there, timings right, a whole nine yards in order to create change. So I hope everybody used all these resources we have uh, at our disposal to have real conversations. And I really hope we can get things changed. I'm going to end it on that. Thank you so much, as always, for your time. Sure. Um, this has been The Coach and AK Experience. This has been The Coach and AK Experience, part of the Sports Fluent Network.